Future Africa Institute and Campus. As part of the University of Pretoria, the Future Africa Institute and Campus has established a vibrant, collaborative space that provides access to the benefits of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research for the leading young minds of tomorrow. Future Africa has been created at University of Pretoria to respond to a unique requirement of the African development, which is the adequation between research and daily social transformation. Transdisciplinarity means collaboration, and to get collaboration, we need a space to do this interaction. Our globally sustainable infrastructure and world-class facilities have created a resident scientist scholarly community that works collectively to bring growth and transformation. Through innovative methods, we combine the knowledge of researchers through pan-African networks that extend beyond disciplines and geopolitical boundaries. The environment we have created thus develops young scientists in transdisciplinary research and science leadership committed to creating an impact in our communities. In aligning with UP's focus on the Sustainable Development Goals, we have based our approach on several themes. These focus on connecting the people of Africa, developing sustainable food systems, ensuring the health and well-being of African communities, empowering individuals through transformative education opportunities, and ensuring equity as well as sustainability in a global Africa. It is Future Africa's unique platform that allows us to continue setting the standard for transforming the world through African research excellence. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this dialogue on, knowledge, on the knowledge economy and generation equality in Africa in honor of Charlotte Matleke, hosted at the Future Africa campus of the University of Pretoria. This is in partnership with stakeholders from government and the Charlotte Manya Matleke Institute. A special welcome to all our esteemed guests partners and official delegates who are joining this event in person and remotely. I am Dr. Stembi Lembete, and I will be driving this dialogue this morning. Thank you for joining us. I believe that this conversation is so timely given the information about the South African economy that we've received in the past two days, particularly uh, the very disturbing and distressing fact that unemployment uh, in the second quarter uh, jumped up to 34.4%. If you take that, if you look at the expanded definition of unemployment, it jumped up to 44.4%. And that really should be concerning to everybody that cares about building a caring functional um, and prosperous uh, society. And so this conversation that we'll be having today about the knowledge economy uh, and its contribution uh, to economic development in South Africa and the continent, I think is hugely uh, important. We would like to encourage you to engage with us on social media using the hashtags hashtag generation equality, uh, as well as hashtag women's month 2021. Before we go any further, I would like to invite uh, Professor Tawana Kupe, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria to welcome our guests. Good morning. Uh, distinguished guests and everybody who is present in-house and also those who are on, online. Before I continue with my uh, greeting, I would like to particularly say this would not have been possible and recognize two senior figures uh, who have been driving this uh, dialogue, this platform, and many other things you will hear or will do. That is Dr. Namane Mahao, who is sitting in the room here with us at the Fisher Africa uh, Auditorium and Dr. Gwen Ramakopa, who is virtual and online, I don't know, sitting where. They have been very tireless in making sure we arrive at this day, and this day is not a destination, it is a beginning. 
and more of that you will hear. So again, let me repeat, good morning, distinguished guests, members of the UP executive, our fellow partner organizations, ladies and gentlemen, it is an immense privilege to be in such an esteemed company for the purpose of this critical dialogue on the knowledge economy and generation equality in Africa. I would like to welcome each and every one of you to this event in a month in which we pay special tribute to more than 20,000 women who marched for the liberation of our country in 1956, leaving out the very legacy bravely fought for by Madame Charlotte McLeake, to his honor we gather here today. Today, we start our journey to launch the Women's Economic Advancement Research Hub for Africa, named after Madame McLeake, who was the first African woman in South Africa to obtain a university degree, a Bachelor of Science. She used her knowledge to mobilize women to fight for democracy and the rights of women, as well as being involved in broad societal development programs. The challenges we face may look different in certain aspects today, but they certainly require the same resilience and intellectual contribution to resolve. We are pleased that there is a thinking to develop the initiative in the long term as a fully fledged research center. I'm putting it modestly here that there is a thinking. It's more than a thinking. There are plans afoot which will result in this research hub being a center that actually focuses, a university-based center that actually focuses, a university-based center with our partners, because on this journey, it cannot be the university alone. It can only be the university with a broad women's organizations, interested individuals, other organizations, our government, and the private sector, making sure that this becomes a reality. So I want to say to you, watch this space. I've spoken out boldly on a few occasions, saying that the future of the world hinges on the future of Africa. Africa is the future, not just for Africans, but for the world, given that its population will, will rise to around one third of the global population by 2100. It is also the youngest population, so we have the unique opportunity to empower our youth as path breakers for the African Knowledge Society to contribute significantly to innovation on the continent and to apply themselves to finding solutions to the multiple crises and disruptions our planet faces. In reimagining our role in broader society, the investor Pretoria has understood the need to come up with strategies which we can collaboratively implement to achieve social equality and environmental sustainability. The center that we are working to, to build together with the, our eminent partners being one example. Universities are well positioned to take the lead in creating new knowledge through adopting a transdisciplinary research approach. This approach involves the university not just being intellectuals inside the university fences, by working closely with societal actors and stakeholders. And that is exactly what we aim to achieve through the Future Africa Institute at UP, a vibrant collaborative space which has a vision to transform the world through African research excellence. A key area of transformation, of course, lies in the need for the continent to extend the participation of women in their, in their economies. And here participation is not the kind of participation which is by invitation from men. It is women as equal, active agents and drivers of change in society. And that paradigm shift needs to happen right now to achieve the desired goals of gender parity in this decade. We look forward to our illustrious panel of speakers sharing their thoughts, ideas, and, and ideas on this theme. And let me say, the, our illustrious speakers today represent the kind of active women who are agents of change, caring their, not themselves only, not their families only, but their communities, the country, and the continent. The Women's Economic, Empower, uh, Economic Advancement Research Hub for Africa, which will be launch, launched later in the year, and remember that the hub is but a step towards the center, will provide a platform for taking forward the contributions and commitments made by President Cyril Ramaphosa as chair of the African Union in the 2020-21 uh, period of chairmanship to escalate the economic empowerment of women. And I use escalate deliberately because we've been slow, we've been tardy, and this task cannot be left at the speed at which we have carried out so far. 
The aim is to extend research collaboration and integration across the continent, <clears throat> excuse me, in a quadruple helix approach involving knowledge institutions, corporate, civil society organizations, and government. And in this regard, the approaches that must inform it are not, if you like, slow, reformist, gradualist approach. It must be active, urgent, sense of urgency, and also addressing systemic change and not only addressing, you know, individual circumstances of individual women. This is a societal systemic uh, effort that is needed with a sense of urgency. The hub will serve as a space for research, analysis, and reference on progress on the economic advancement of women, and also designed to measure progress against set goals of the African Agenda 2063 and the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. We know 2030 is not too far from now, and that even on that score, we are lagging behind. So we should use this effort to get to 2020 is accelerating the actions that need to be done and being intentional and active about doing it. As an integrating research platform, it will function virtually with limited internal staff linked to key experts, partners in the country across the continent and globally. Remember, this is when we're talking about the hub, but when it comes a center, you will find that it is actively staffed and, and also there are people on the ground as well as people using virtual technologies in order to collaborate and work together across the continent. The Future Africa Institute at UP is well placed to serve as a host for harnessing the promotion and integration of this research. And we look forward to outcomes such as available evidence-based information on gender, women, and the economy. This is not to say it's not, uh, we don't have it now, but we need even more deeper, more nuanced, more multi-perspective data or information, if you like, not just economic data from one economic perspective, but from multiple perspectives, social data, history, all of those uh, things informing our approaches. Advisory services on innovating tools to advance generation equality goals, advocacy tools, development, and much more, infusing a sense of activism among not only women, but the youth and also and the youth across the gender line, if you like, including young men and, and, and young women. Charlotte McCracken may not have seen the changes in women's rights that she would have hoped to in her lifetime. It is a battle that is still being fought, but we can certainly say that the land camp today is more nuanced, more nuanced in more senses than one. It's not a, we cannot stand here or sit here and say, it's very, very positive and better. We know it is complex, it is complicated, it is intersectional, some things move and sometimes it's like one step forward, two steps back. We need to be ensuring that one step forward doubles the steps forward and there's no, there's no uh, uh, going backwards, if you like. Former US President Barack Obama said, quote, if you are walking down the right path and you are willing to keep walking, eventually you will make progress. Today's dialogue, uh, let me just say about the quote from, uh, uh, from President Obama, I agree with the quote, except that I want faster progress. I do not want simple eventuality. We have to actually double up the pace in this space. Today's dialogue shows that it's clear that together we share a compelling sense of a belief that by mobilizing and bringing together our collective expertise, we can keep going down the road towards progress and not waver. Where gender inequity is, a, is, is breached and the economic emancipation of women across Africa, across urban and rural divides is achieved. I think we can do this. We have to be intentional, we have to be active, we have to be ethical, we have to be, we have to be committed. It is not an option not to do it. I thank you. Thank you, Prof. Coupe, for uh, that excellent message and for highlighting the urgency uh, of these interventions. As you were speaking and uh, 
noting that this is Women's Month in commemoration uh, of the 1956 uh, march uh, against passes, I was reminded that the first women's march uh, against the pass laws in South Africa was organized uh, by uh, Charlotte Matleke in 1913. Uh, and it was, they organized the march. Um, she organized it under the auspices of the Bantu Women's League and to really fight for the rights of uh, women who were working as domestic workers uh, in Bloemfontein. And so that march was not just about women's rights to movement, uh, but it was also all just about political rights, but it was also about women's economic rights uh, and the ability of women to participate uh, equally as economic actors. And so it is exciting to hear that the university will be supporting uh, this Women's Economic Advancement Research Hub that will turn into a center uh, to really help us to achieve uh, the great dreams and goals of women such as uh, Ma'am uh, Charlotte Matleke. I would now like to um, welcome the Director General of the Department of Women, uh, Youth and Persons with Disabilities, uh, Advocate Mikateko Joyce Maluleke. Advocate, I'm handing over to you. Uh, Advocate Maluleke, I think that you are still muted. Thank you. <laughs> My apology. Uh, Program Director, Dr. Stembile Mbete, Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Professor Dawana Kupe, Minister in the Presidency for Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities, Honorable Maite Nkwan Mashabani, Minister for Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Dr. Nkosa Zanadlamini Zuma, Executive Director of UN Women, Dr. Pum Zilem Lambongnuka, um, Madam Ellen Johnson Salif, first woman president of an African country, former president of Liberia, Dr. Precious Muloi Mutsipe, chair of Mutsipo Foundation, Dr. Anna Mukhokom, Ms. Isabel Frey, Professor Margaret Chitiga Mabungu, Dr. Gwen Ramukhopa, Dr. Namane Mahau, Ms. Futim Toba, Dr. Mbete, all participants and respondents. Good morning. I am greatly honored to welcome you all to this dialogue on knowledge economy and generation equality in Africa in honor of Me Charlotte Manye Matreke. I would like to extend a special welcome to our panelists, respondents, local and international guests, as well as participants. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to start by saying to the department, pardon me, allow me to start by saying that the Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities is mandated to regulate the socioeconomic transformation and implementation of the empowerment and participation of women, youth, and persons with disabilities. This is a huge mandate which could be achieved through partnerships and collaborations with institutions of higher learning, development partners, private sector, and civil society organizations. I'm happy to indicate that my department has established a partnership with the University of Pretoria this partnership is not only with respect to the dialogue, but with many other initiatives of the empowerment and participation of women, youth and persons with disabilities. Institutions of higher education are the major driver of information and knowledge systems, linking it with economic development. The National Development Plan places education, training and innovation as central to the overall um, development goals. These uh, areas contribute to productivity, which enhances economic growth. The partnership will help us to review our strategies and find more pragmatic approach in meeting our development goal, um, goals and targets. Institutions of higher education are knowledge generators and are also areas of research, collaboration, 
and establishment of networks. This partnership will also help us in building research capacity through access to larger pool of researchers whom we could collaborate with to, to promote the empowerment of women, youth and persons with disabilities and gender equality. The dialogue on knowledge economy and generation equality in honor of Charlotte Manye Mateke came at an opportune time when the country is celebrating the Women's Month. The theme of the dialogue is aligned with the Women's Month, which is the year of Charlotte Manye Mateke realizing uh, women's rights. Ladies and gentlemen, today, today's dialogue provides us with an opportunity to pay tribute to the generations of women whose struggles laid the foundation for the progress made in empowering women and achieving gender equality to date. They, the very same challenges and issues that confronted the generation of Charlotte Manya Makweke are still relevant today as seen through the demands raised by the Generation Equality Campaign. This is a call for all of us to come with drastic actions that will accelerate the implementation of the commitments for gender equality. Ladies and gentlemen, 26 years after the adoption of the Beijing Platform for Action, women still face challenges such as gender pay gap, equal sharing of unpaid care and domestic work, sexual harassment, and all forms of violence against women and girls. Healthcare services that respond to their needs and their equal participation in political life and decision-making in all areas of life. With these few words, allow me to welcome all panelists, respondents, and participants to the dialogue. I believe that the outcomes of the dialogue will form part of the resources that will enable us to make changes that will impact on the lives of women and girls, not only during our lifetime, but also to the future of generations. I thank you, Ndolebuk. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate Maleke, for those uh, inspiring words. We appreciate the role that you are playing uh, in this initiative of closing the economic gender gap and promoting women's emancipation. I think it's particularly uh, warming and encouraging to see the kind of partnership uh, that we are seeing between government and the University of Pretoria and other stakeholders because this is what is necessary to ensure that we can uh, turn the research that comes out of universities into real life impact. Uh, I would now like to uh, introduce uh, the Minister of Women, Youth and Persons with Disabilities, uh, Minister Maite Nguana Mashabane, to ask her to contribute uh, to this dialogue. Professor Tawana Kupe. Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Dr. Pumzile Mlambonguka, Executive Director of the UN Women, Your Excellency Madam Ellen Johnson Salif, former President of Liberia, ladies and gentlemen. As we continue to celebrate the Women's Month and commemorate the heroic women of 1956, we are cognizant of the ongoing challenges and systematic barriers facing women today. While some progress has been made to achieve gender equality and equity, the emancipation of women is still a lot of work that waits for us ahead. 2021 World Economic Forum report knows that it will take about 135 years to reach gender equality. 
Furthermore, according to McKenzie, it will take Africa about 140 years to achieve full parity if we do not take drastic action now. Therefore, closing the gender gap uh, for women and girls in all spheres of all uh, life is urgent globally and particularly in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action 26 odd years ago was groundbreaking for women empowerment and gender equality. As we move forward, the concept of generation equality provides a unique opportunity uh, for the uh, acceleration of the implementation of Beijing Platform of Action. Accordingly, uh, generation equality places a challenge to all of us to come up with concrete actions for the realization of the gender equality before 2030. In this regard, there is a nexus between generation equality and knowledge equality. As we converge today to exchange views on knowledge economy and generation equality in Africa, it is also an opportunity to honor our forebears like Me Mahomu Charlotte Manya Mateke, who was the first South African woman to acquire a science degree from Ohio in America. She made this invaluable contribution that led to encouraging more women to come forward and to make democracy indispensable. Her contribution to politics, education, development, religion, and other sectors was significant. It is important to ensure that knowledge economy benefit women and girls in order to accelerate the attainment of gender equality. Knowledge has become the primary resource of production and knowledge economy is the primary economy among developed nations and is dependent on human capital. The economic access of our country requires skills that can foster a knowledge economy. The availability of the skills will influence the gender balance with the workforce. Let us work together to ensure that women acquire such skills which are highly sought. We need to invest more in careers within the STEM uh, fields as this is where many of the greatest opportunities for career or advancement, high uh, compensation and top level executive positions can be found. The involvement of women and girls in science, technology, mathematics and engineering is key. It is reported that analysis of the 2020 National Senior Certificate results shows that the number of girls who enrolled for mathematics 
and physical science over the past five years is greater than that of boys. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to put more emphasis on the issues of equal pay for work and for the same value when we reflect on the knowledge economy, including the issues of remuneration of women scientists. Some reports indicate that scientists and less have less prestige within departments and also face greater difficulty in receiving research grants. We have to extend women's access to networks that provide opportunities to work in high profile projects, which includes attending conferences and other opportunities. Let us also address the issue of unpaid care, uh, work and family responsibilities. These responsibilities place women in a disadvantaged position as they are at times forced to take on part-time roles that pay less and are seen as less important in order to accommodate work and family. This and other barriers and obstacles are issues that are what Mama Tege and other forebearers of our struggle fought to remove. We need to take drastic actions in order to realize the generation equality. We need to actually bury patriarchy. As we celebrate the role and the contribution of our a society for 365 days of the year, let us work together to tackle the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and gender-based violence and femicide. As we do so, let us remember to live by the values of Ma Charlotte Mahomu Manya Matake, as I said earlier on, believed as reflected in her powerful words when she argued, This work is not for yourselves. Kill that spirit of self and do not live above your people, but live with them. And if you can rise, please bring someone with you. Lift as you rise. I thank you. We are delighted to know that Minister Nkwana Mashabane is pushing the agenda uh, of women's emancipation from her position. Women in high positions really do have a unique contribution to make in fast tracking uh, the agenda of women's emancipation through leading by example and influencing policy. Uh, something that strikes me from what uh, the minister said is the burdens uh, that are placed on girls and women uh, in terms of unpaid care work uh, and family responsibilities, which really impact uh, on their ability to uh, participate in the economy. It is something that we have seen uh, as uh, lecturers and academics that our students, our women students who have been studying from home uh, over the past year, really have dealt with the burden of uh, looking after their homes and looking after younger children. Um, and indeed, Generation Equality Campaign demands that there be equal sharing of unpaid care and domestic work. I now would like to um, 
introduce an address that we will have a pre-recorded video from uh, Madame Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who is one of the iconic figures uh, in the call to create a just and equitable world uh, as the first woman president uh, of uh, an African country, Liberia, and as the first woman chairperson of the economic community of West African states. She continues to do amazing work uh, promoting uh, women's equality. Uh, let us hear from Madame Johnson Sirleaf. Warm greetings to all distinguished participants, particularly the organizers. Thank you for inviting me to this important discussion. I regret that I am unable to join you all in person, but I believe that we all have understood the need for great adjustments in our lives due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me acknowledge just a few present at the risk of leaving out many for which I offer apologies. Ministers Nakusana Laminisuma, Nakuana Maiti Lashabani, warm greetings to you both. My sister, Pomsili Mlambo Akuka, former head of UN Women and a leading member of the African Women Leaders Network. My warm congratulations on the excellent work you did while leading UN Women, kept by the very successful Generation Equality Summit meeting. Professor Tanana Kupa, First Chancellor of the University of Pretoria, Neo Masiko, and of course, Dr. Namani Mahau, who was the lead of the interactions with my office. I became acquainted with the legacy of Charlotte Masese only very recently, when I was invited to speak at a meeting of the ANC Women's League honoring her 150th anniversary. A sexy's life reminds us of that of many women, impacting powerfully, but not publicly acknowledged until much later, but sometimes never. This year of recognition and reflection on her life should give comfort to her relatives and to all women who labor invisibly but change the world one step at a time. Distinguished participants, I will offer brief remarks as there are many speakers. We are gathered largely virtually due to the devastating impact of the COVID virus. We do not pass a day without being affected by it and without wondering when the pall it has cast over the world will be lifted. But many important things have been learned over these past almost two years. One is that African unity is even more imperative now it has only been by speaking with one voice that we have been able to move the needle on vaccine inequality, as slow as that is happening. Gaining the support of leaders whose countries hold vaccine patents for vaccine to be produced closer to the points of need, such as in South Africa, would not have happened but for the collective voices of African leaders within the African Union framework. It is this recognition that a common problem cannot be defeated by one single country and the understanding that solidarity and sharing of knowledge must be the engine for African regional integration. Africa 2063 aligns squarely with the SDGs 2030 agenda. 
And progress in the SDGs means progress towards the Africa we want. However, we cannot shy away from it. The COVID pandemic has pushed hundreds of thousands deeper into poverty, almost derailed progress in some instances, and in others, forced countries to prioritize particular goals out of what is supposed to be an integrated agenda with no goal superseding the others, except of course, gender equality. I believe that the achievement of gender, of gender equity is the linchpin of the SDGs in Africa 2063, and if achieved, will ensure all the others. One of the reasons why Africa has not achieved the integration desired is because we continue to put an emphasis on individual countries instead of harnessing the immense power of our 54 countries. I referred to the gains, albeit limited, in infrastructure and those made in using our collective voice for ending vaccine inequality and insufficiency. Let's use that experience as the impetus to look at the impediments to regional integration. One of the main issues is the difficulty of crossing borders. Many of us have been flying the flag for ACFTA, our African Continental Free Trade Agreement. But the foundation of trade across countries, whether in neighbor groups or across continent, is people. Trade cannot happen without people moving. I can attest to the ECOWAS passport as a vehicle for increased regional trade. The West Africa power pool is also a good example. Power generated in La Côte d'Ivoire is shared with Mono River Union countries, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone also crossing the francophone gang anglophone divide. Other sources of power are being shared between countries and currently 14 of the 15 ECOWAS states are benefiting. But the obstacles remain even in West Africa. Resistance to open borders happens at the point of crossing for many particularly women traders who are sexually harassed and forced to pay bribes. Many countries need to review legislation which places burdensome restrictions on people's movements and the trade they engage in, whether on foot, by cars, trains, trucks and planes. I should probably add drones as we are seeing the rapid rise of their use for delivery of essential goods and information. Some will remind me that we need to be mindful of threats from extremism and open borders will exacerbate those threats. This is true, but in some cases, Regional integration can spur prosperity, helping to assuage grievances rooted in inequality of benefits from natural resources and diminish marginalization. Some countries also need to look at the power of the diaspora and relax rules on dual citizenship. This can be twinned with SDG investment mapping to identify accelerators, clean energy access, smart agriculture for food security, manufacturing, health, education, women in leadership, the education of girls and equality of leadership for women are two of the greatest accelerators 
for sustainable and people-centered development. The accelerator of generational change is also foundational. Many young Africans are technologically adept and already using their skills to solve development problems. They are also demanding change and leading it. We cannot tell them that they are the leaders of tomorrow. They want to lead today and we must make this happen. Distinguished participants, let us follow the example of our sister, Ma Charlotte, to seek and share knowledge, to lead for good, and to demand equity and equality of women and men. This is the only way that we will change the world and leave it a better place for our children and grandchildren. Thank you for the opportunity. May you have a great meeting. After that uh, excellent address by uh, Madame Johnson Sirleaf, where she highlights in particular uh, the importance of the agenda for women's emancipation in terms of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations and Agenda 2063 uh, of the African Union. I would now like to uh, welcome one of our own South African women icons, uh, Dr. Pumzile Mlambongoga, who is the former Executive Director of UN Women and Under Secretary General of the United Nations uh, to address us on this issue. Greetings to all of you who are here to dialogue and mark Women's Month, Women's Day, under the theme that celebrates Mama Charlotte McGregor, who was a great woman, an educator, a scientist, a woman who stood up at the time when patriarchy was most intense. We mark Women's Month this year in the midst of a pandemic. Women were disproportionately affected by the pandemic. They lost jobs, two thirds of the jobs that were lost in the pandemic in the world were lost by women. They experienced higher levels of gender-based violence. And women are in the majority of those who do not have digital literacy. And they therefore lost jobs. And they are the majority of those who need to be supported so that they are employable in the future. Girls who were out of school because of the pandemic are in the majority of those who did not go back to schools when schools reopened. And we have a responsibility, as Mom Charlotte would have done, to find those girls and to bring them back to school. Girls in some countries were also married off during the pandemic and they were also trafficked. All of those are challenges that face us. We can build back better because what we had, what the status quo was, was not good enough. What we need for the future of South Africa is a country that ensures that the equality between men and women is sacrosanct. It is good governance. It is a right for women and it makes business sense. We have a lot of women who are high achievers and are committed to making our country the best it can be. Our country is in crisis but this is a crisis 
that we can solve and we can only do that if we put all hands on deck so i welcome all the hands i also bring my own hands for all of us to work together to rebuild our country thank you Thank you to Dr. Mlambo Nguga for reminding us that uh, equality is good governance and it is makes for good business as well, that we can't uh, have a, a properly governed world with half of the world's population excluded uh, from participation and contribution to the decisions that are made. Uh, I'd now like to uh, call upon uh, Dr. Nkosa Zanazlamini Zuma, the Minister of Cooperative Governance uh, and Traditional Affairs, who is joining us uh, remotely to address us on this issue. Uh, thank you very much and good morning to all the participants. Uh, I'll just greet a few in the interest of time. Um, the Vice President, Vice Principal of the University of Pretoria, Professor Jawana Kupe, uh, President Ellen John Salif, uh, our UN Women Director, Kumzile Mlambungu, Dr. Plain Zimande, and all the comrades who are here and participants. I wish to thank you for the honor to participate in this dialogue, Knowledge Economy and Generation Equality in Africa, in honor of May Charlotte MacLeod. A dialogue occurs as we approach and commemorate the actions and contributions of all the women who have brought us to where we are, not only the ones who marched to the union building, but also all the women who have been on the forefront of our struggle and freedom. The 1945 United Nations Charter reaffirmed fundamental human rights, equal rights of men and women in all nations, large and small. The 1948 Universal Declaration reaffirmed that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights without distinction in any kind, such as sex, race, language, color. So given that fact, and the fact that our own constitution affirms that, I think up like the women who march to Pretoria and stop acting as though it's a favor that we are being done or that we must beg men for these rights. I think it's high time we really stand up and demand these rights because to wait for these hundred odd years for these rights to happen uh, is not on. So that would be my first point. My second point is that actually um, women in Africa, the majority of them still work in agriculture. They don't own the land. They are landless. They don't have access to land for themselves. They are just workers. And I think that must change. We must also uh, be able to utilize their skills. They have the skills, but they don't have the land. So, uh, modern ways of agriculture, as President John Sinsalif has just said, including vertical agriculture, which does not need a lot of land, but needs technology. Uh, we, 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 we should be able to assist women to, to move because that's the skill that the majority of the women have. 
but also women should have access to finance, both finance and resources of government, but also in the private sector. In government, I think all our governments must adopt gender responsive budgeting because it's only then that you can tell what resources are actually going to women. As we stand today, our budgets are gender blind. I cannot tell you even in my department, how many rents or how many cents in a rent go towards women's emancipation or women's empowerment and development. So I think that's one of the things that institutions like this one should assist us to actually entrench in all our, in all our governments in all the countries. So that way we can know whether women are actually having sufficient access to the finances of the state. In the private sector, again, we know that it's very difficult for women to get finances from the private sector. Even though it's known that women pay better, but it's still a very big mountain to climb to get women uh, to have access to, do, to those finances. So somehow we must find a way of making sure that that happens. At the workplace, besides the, 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 the wage gap, which we must close, we must make it like Iceland. It must be illegal to pay women less for um, the, the same uh, work of the same value. But it's not only the wage gap, it's also the conditions at work that are not the same. When men go and play golf on a Wednesday, it's normal. But if a woman wants to work from home for whatever reason, except now with COVID, maybe it's better, or to look after her children and still work from home, it's an issue. So we must also ensure that the working conditions for women are the same as men, besides that they must end the same for the same work. I also think the skills, I mean, knowledge economy needs skills and we must girls and boys, young men and young women and men and women um, without the We seem to have uh, lost uh, Minister Lamini Zuma. Uh, I think it's a connectivity issue. Uh, the kinds of things that we deal with uh, in this new world uh, of online uh, and remote connectivity. Uh, so I will, um, I'm just waiting to hear if we can get her back. All right, so uh, I will now hand over to uh, Dr. Uh, Anna Mohokong, who is also joining us uh, remotely uh, to uh, continue our program for us. Can I conclude? Can I conclude? Yes, of course. Hi, Dr. Yes, of course, uh, Dr. Zamini I'm so sorry, uh, my internet is, is, is is playing up today. I, I'm so sorry about that. I was just talking about the skills and I think institutions uh, uh, of higher learning uh, should be very active in this. Uh, just to close, I want to just quote from one of my favorite writers. He's a man, but he writes well, uh, Ben Okri. 
uh, in the magic tale of love and regeneration. He, he quotes that there are plants in the forest that never seem to flower or blossom. And then one day, to everyone's surprise, they bloom with astonishing spl splendor. I just hope that day will come soon when women will bloom with that uh, astonishing splendor because we've been sitting in the forest uh, as plants, but never really seeming to flower or bloom. And I hope that as everybody has said, including the vice, the vice, the vice chancellor that there is, as we must have a sense of agency. It cannot be business as usual. So that day must come soon when we as women can bloom with splendor. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister, for that uh, and for that beautiful uh, closing uh, of uh, the time when we as women uh, can bloom with splendor. Also, thank you for uh, emphasizing uh, the importance of gender responsive budgeting uh, for um, ensuring that uh, every cent that is spent in uh, our economy and by our government can actually contribute to women's emancipation. I would now like to call upon Dr. Anna Mohokong to address us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Metem. Um, Professor Cooper, our gracious host, and, and our moderator, Dr. Mbete, our illustrious guests, and a special acknowledgement to Mas, uh, Ellen Johnson Salif and our very own Umam Dr. Mlambunguga, our cabinet ministers, Umam Gwane, Dr. Gosezana um, Zuma, Uba Blady, and our dignitaries, speakers, panelists, and participants. I greet you all this morning in honor of our fallen heroines. And this year we honor Uma Dr. Charlotte Matrege. And I also greet you in honor of those who are still uh, here with us, forging ahead in their resilience to make a difference for us to achieve gender equality. This morning, because I, I wear many hats, so I'm not too sure, Dr. Mbete, where I fall in, but I select to choose a head of being a corporate in South Africa and in Africa. And I, like, I would just like to sit on that, in that position of being a corporate and how we view things and how we view uh, acceleration of gender parity and equality you know, in our land. So, I'll talk about the role that leaders of corporates, industries, and institutions can do to escalate the process of closing gender equity gap within their institutions and externally. The most important thing is, it's so amazing, and it's human nature. People are driven by policies, laws, compliance, we have seen it in South Africa, where we started in 94, where we didn't have policies that govern this kind of conduct and behavior of companies and institutions. But through the laws uh, and, and through compliance, we have seen a shift and a movement and a change in attitude. Policies must be ingrained in the culture of the organization it must be a given that the institution is diverse in its culture and also parity as well. And this should be monitored in a tangible way. I think we're tired of repeating ourselves every year, every woman's month on this subject. This, is, this should not be a talk show at all. It is, should be the norm, like we have adjusted to the pandemic. It has become a norm to work from home or to do things the way we do it. So it must be a norm that there must be quality in our land. And executives and leadership must be held accountable and assessed 
I'm one person who believes in motivating people and not just carrying a stick because I sit on many remuneration committees and we look at how these executives perform. And we do have in our assessment scale and assessment, all these matters that we are talking about. Even their remuneration, their, their, their incentives, short-term and long-term, we are bringing them now onto the phone to say, if you are a CEO of a company and you don't transform, it's going to bite you. And it's going to bite you in the form of your remuneration. And even if we do consider having you as the leader of the organization, whether you are progressive or not, and we are not apologetic about that. Numbers don't lie. We have remuneration committees at a board level. And these must have teeth, these remuneration committees. There's no point just meeting to have teeth. We, it must have teeth and must analyze the situation in the company well, as we have the oversight role of ensuring that these organizations or institutions are well aligned to the policies of the company. And promotions must take into consideration female representation to deserving candidates, not a tick a box exercise where you just want to tick a box because you want to get done with the compliance and get a, a level one BE certificate. No, you have to bring deserving candidates. I can, I can always, I'll always be remembering this story about uh, nine years ago, I joined the ShopRite Holdings Board as the only woman amongst all the men. And this happened in several boards. And I remember the media in South Africa was like saying, oh, Dr. Anna is gonna be very lonely in the board. No, they'd missed a point. I had a mission. And today um, I'm moving towards the afternoon of my career there. Uh, I now have overseen the policy of the company as I sit in the nomination committee and the remuneration committee and policy was changed in the company to ensure that we bring females on board. We now have six female candidates on the board from zero to what, you, what we have. Your comment may be, Prof Cooper, is that fast enough? Um, well, I must tell you, corporate South Africa is moving in a slow pace because of the hard attitudes we have, you know, uh, the dominance of patriarchy. And it has, it's not even a racism thing. It's a patriarchal thing. Uh, and men tend to dominate. And unless they are kind of not to do, to move forward, they move slow. So I want to congratulate the JSE because the Jordan Specs Stock Exchange controls the big boys, the big companies of the continent, or, you know, of the, of the country and in the top 40 companies, they now have a policy. And I must say the leadership of the JSE has been female, female chairman, female CEO. So they also influence the policy of saying all these companies annually must provide a gender equality report. Actually a policy, the report and how they are progressing. So the JSE is coming also from another angle of controlling these corporates, you know, in that way to ensure that we move forward. Surely we can be moving forward. One, moment, at one point I want to stress that I believe is very key in changing the scenario a bit faster than we are at the moment is the issue of, you know, the retailers uh, who I believe are influencers and can influence this drive of achieving gender parity quite speedy. You know, they have the power of procurement, the same as government as well. Government is the largest spender in procurement. And also academic institutions also have a huge procurement spend. You can influence your suppliers that you don't do business with a company that hasn't got female representation. And the way companies like business, they will ensure that they do it. Uh, so you can be an influencer. You know, influencers are not only in social media, but also in, on the economic side, because you can influence a trend of how people move. Uh, so I do believe, and then, you know, these retailers can offer very, very important, profound offtakes, like for a female farmer. 
They can place an order in advance for the year. How much lettuce they're going to buy, how much beetroot they're going to take in the form of a contract. And the female farmer can now take that to the bank because that is now bankable and fundable. This is how we can turn around things quite quicker. And then also the payment terms, how you pay the suppliers. Uh, we have policies that say female owned companies get paid in seven days or 14 days. So this enables the fundability. And then there's also another point I want to touch on the partnerships between private sector, government and the knowledge institutions. I see this being the way to go. Government needs information and credible information, empirical information for them to make policies. How do they make policies without information? Prof. Cooper, that's where you come in because we would like to see this research progressing. Uh, and I once attended an, uh, an event, Prof. Cooper, where you were acknowledging female side research. I mean, you were acknowledging researchers. Most of them were actually female. I was amazed that they've come out with profound. They do profound research. Also as corporates, we need to partner with you. And uh, because we need the outcome of the research. I love the issue of this, the creation of the hub because we can tap into that. But also we have funding through our various funding abilities in companies like the CSI funding. Uh, we also have funding for uh, promoting education and so on. So I see this being fundamental. What is making us left behind from Cooper? Why we are not moving fast enough? We are operating as silos or in silos when we should be working as one in unison because that can be very powerful and can hasten the pace. However, we need to all have the, have the same mindset of where we are going and how fast do we want to go because we can be slow. And we were very happy when government appointed the first female auditor general. Uh, we're very happy to see this because this is the change we want to see that women must be given and afforded powerful positions where they are in control of, of huge vast of, of funding and responsibilities in that regard. Um, I think I can go on and on. I've got many things to say about this subject, but I just want to thank all those corporates who have begun to move ahead, forge ahead uh, in partnering. I mean, I'm not saying this has not happened or it's not happening, it is happening, but I, I just want to see it progress in a more profound way. Um, so I would like to thank you very much for this opportunity of just sharing a few ideas I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mohugong, for that uh, energizing uh, and really motivating presentation and for emphasizing some really important um, issues around using your position and your agency to really bring about fundamental change. It's not enough to just be included uh, in an institution. Uh, you also must use that inclusion to dismantle the patriarchal structures and the systems that you find there. And um, the what you've said also about retailers as influencers, uh, the report that was written that came out uh, from the UN Women, uh, of which uh, Dr. Uh, Machau contributed uh, extensively to on women's procurement um, and uh, the state and other uh, institutions really needing to uh, procure from women's businesses. The target, I think, that was set was 40%. Uh, and, and that is a way of actually not just having policies and, and nice things that are written down, but implementing change uh, that has a ripple effect um, on, on, on our society. So thank you so much uh, for that. Um, we now are going to have a panel discussion uh, with uh, some uh, of our speakers in studio, as well as some who are joining us remotely. Joining us remotely, we have uh, Dr. Precious uh, Muloy Mudzibe, who is a well-known um, medical doctor and businesswoman. Uh, we have also joining us in studio, uh, Professor uh, Margaret Chitiga Mabugu, uh, and uh, we have uh, Miss Isabel Fry joining us uh, in studio. And joining us remotely, we have uh, Miss Futim Toba. Uh, Doctor, uh, Professor um, 
Coupe will also be joining us uh, as part of this panel. So welcome to all of you and thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, today. I would like to start with you, uh, Prof. Uh, Margaret, around what we just heard uh, from uh, Dr. Mohokong about the role that knowledge institutions uh, can play uh, in promoting uh, inclusive innovation uh, for uh, a better future. How do you think that could be uh, done, especially with your work uh, here? Thank you very much, uh, Program Director, and thank you to the high-level discussions that we've had, absolutely inspiring. So coming from an academic institution, Firstly, I cannot uh, help myself but share some of the work that I have done and that my colleagues in my Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences have also done. We have been uh, involved in work that tries to understand, for example, why women are left behind. And we have vast knowledges in terms of this. Why are women poorer than men? Why is it that in the sectors of our economy, women are predominantly employed in service sectors, for example, where we saw during the pandemic, these were the most uh, uh, important or impacted sectors. We also see that women are in the lower echelons of employment. They tend to be the least uh, skilled individuals. So these are all concerns, these are all issues that we're looking at. We, we, we celebrate the fact that we have in South Africa at least great uh, data from uh, Statistics South Africa, but we think we can still uh, have more. We have women in our uh, um, researchers in our faculty looking at women leadership and trying to understand and grow women leadership. We heard very clearly from, from the discussions and, and uh, from Dr. Anna specifically that women leadership is critical for us to grow uh, and, and uh, at least reduce this gender gap. So, so just talking from the, the faculty and from the work that we have done, it was clear for us uh, uh, that during the pandemic, and we all know this, women suffered more than men. We, it was clear to us that poverty of women increased uh, uh, more than uh, men. Statistics South Africa data is showing us uh, clearly that girls, uh, at least 17% of, of uh, young girls mentioned that home responsibility prevented them from going to to school, whereas only 0.3% of uh, boys uh, mentioned the same reason. This is, this is uh, devastating, this is critical, this is urgent. And therefore, I join our Vice-Chancellor uh, in terms of uh, um, pushing this agenda and saying that we need to start acting now. Resources in, in uh, uh, research needs resources. I cannot uh, uh, not mention this. Mm -hmm. And it was mentioned, it is recognized in terms of uh, government budgets, in terms of corporate budgets. And, and I just really, again, in support of the hub and the center that our vice chancellor mentioned, we in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences are already placed and already playing in, in this uh, field of uh, understanding women and gender. And, and a call as well for for additional resources for, for females and for female-related uh, studies. Excellent. Thank you uh, so much and for highlighting the very important work uh, that the EMS faculty is doing uh, around uh, researching and finding out uh, about women's economic uh, inclusion and what it actually looks like. I'm horrified by the statistic that you've given about the number of girls that have had to miss school um, because uh, of the pandemic. Um, Isabel, I'd like to turn to you quickly to ask about, you know, we heard a, a, how terrible um, the, the pandemic has been for women um, as uh, service workers, uh, but also the majority of the people in our informal sector are women uh, and who seem to have been neglected and left out uh, of, of government uh, economic recovery plans. Um, what do you think needs to be done to really include women in all parts uh, of, of the economy? Thanks very much, Dr. Mbeti, and, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation to this august panel, um, as Margaret was saying. I think the, the speakers who've gone before um, link into your question about how do we bring that, how do we close that gap? How do we bring people who are so significantly part of society and yet so um, 
marginalized, so on the periphery. And part of that comes to the fact that historically women in South Africa have really uh, carried a huge burden of the poverty, of the burden of social reproduction. If one goes back to the question of the migrant labor system and, and how women were expected to continue to carry um, our nation without any recognition, without financial support, um, and certainly without the kinds of, of hope and future that things will change. And I think that's why for me, Madame Charlotte Matreke was just so inspiring because within the space that she operated in, she managed to rise far above any of the expectations. So in the height of the oppression that she existed in, she created beauty. She was a choral singer and went to the UK and the US and sang. Um, in the height of her oppression, she was at the founding of the precursor of the ANC, the SANNC, although she wasn't recognized, she was there. And also in her oppression, she managed to maintain a faith um, through her church, through her social work, which enabled her to see a vision for the future. So coming back to where we are right now, um, for me, having worked in social policy for a number of years, um, heading the Social uh, Studies in Poverty and Inequality Institute, We've looked at poverty, we've looked at exclusions, we've looked at trying to find solutions, and social security policy really seems to be where that solution is. Uh, you've, we've heard many people talking about the concept of a universal basic income grant as both the, a humanitarian response to meeting people's needs, but also providing the kind of, of currency circulation and redistribution that would be required for women in the informal sector, uh, for people who are trying to bridge the ability to sustain small businesses, micro businesses. We know that the township economy has had a huge amount of investment and yet the, the, the returns are not there. Um, and so a short, a long answer to your <laughs> short question is really by looking courageously, um, seeing what we as the most unequal country in the world could do to ensure that the, the most oppressed and invisible people are uplifted. I think we need to do something, a universal BIG. And I mean, just to, just to talk about, Margaret and, and Anna were talking about policies. Policies are critical, but sometimes policies are shaped badly. So the Social Relief of Distress grant that was introduced, um, which ended in April, excluded 7.1 million black African caregivers because they were already receiving grants for the children. So although men who were not able to access any other sort of UIF or that were able to receive the social relief of distress, the women, because they were recognized only in their capacity as caregivers and not as individual rights holders, were excluded. That has been changed, but it does mean that as we create a kind of vision for inclusive environment, we need to look at the universality that goes about ensuring that no one is excluded Errors of exclusion are terrible, um, and they can have fatal consequences to people and society. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and highlighting, I didn't realize that for uh, women, uh, for, for caregivers uh, being recognized through the social security system as caregivers, but not as individuals uh, with, with, with rights uh, of their own uh, to economic inclusion. So thank you for that. I see that we have uh, Ms. Futim Toba on screen. Hi. Uh, hi, ma'am. It's so nice to have you uh, with us. I would like to ask uh, a question because I know that you work uh, extensively with a number of different organizations. Um, what role do you think that multinational institutions, including the development um, and finance institutions, uh, can play in uh, enabling um, an ecosystem that uh, closes uh, the, the gender gap, uh, the equity gap, um, and how can that be done? Uh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, Professor Cooper, in his introduction, he told us that we have a uh, sense of agency to address all this. Um, and then this, our response must have a, a system change. So to respond to your questions around the, the, the what the multinationals can do, um, I would like to also link it to the opportunities that um, the free trade agreement uh, poses to us. 
obviously, uh, as it has been said, uh, within the, the context of, uh, of the continent, we have understood where women find themselves as far as trade is concerned, in the sense that um, the African Development Bank indicates that although we are two, about two thirds of the agricultural labor, most of such um, work that we do, the, the, we find ourselves in areas where there is low skills and we cannot effectively trade. So similarly for women in the low skill manufacturing, they, we are always characterized by lots of lack of skills and and a risk of um, of of losing our job the jobs when any company decides to move, particularly because you find that multi um, national institutions are always seeking for for areas where they can have low costs. So those people who are usually the victims of such um, tends to be women. The, the multinationals really have the biggest capacity in terms of that usually when they enter the countries, they bring um, technical know-how, they bring skills in the countries in which we operate. And whereas it is okay to, for them to bring those skills, what we have found is that there's very limited knowledge transfer and they consistently bring the expatriates in that sense, leaving the countries where they operate um, without building much capacity. So what we should be asking, particularly within the context of the policies in South Africa of, of empowerment, we should be asking the multinationals to invest in capacity building. Also make sure that they provide opportunities, particularly for women to travel in their countries to learn how best is best and also support within this, the, the skills development. Earlier speakers have mentioned around the lack of knowledge, whether be it scientific or training, which is the, your responsibility. But after gaining that knowledge from an academic institution, you have to practice. And that is where we fall short. And um, I believe that's the, the, the role that multinationals can play. So what should be the difference? The difference should be that we have to be specific about targeting women empowerment. And depending on that skills deficit, um, the multinationals should then encourage that um, the, the exchange the exchange programs. So in terms of what is practically happened and or what is the constraint at the moment, I think the previous speaker, Dr. Anna, mentioned it very perfectly in that there are a lot of pockets of excellence some in, 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 or in, in other companies. However, those pockets of excellence remain pockets of excellence. What we need in this country is a framework that will assist that we copy what is good and then at the same time share lessons learned. What pleases me at the current moment with the work that I'm doing as part of the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence, which is looking at empowering of, 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 of women because we all understand how there is a link uh, between the empowerment of women and um, gender-based uh, violence. Pillar five of that uh, collaborations particularly focuses on women economic empowerment and the 
And the critical aspect and the differentiator that will result in that systemic change is that it's an ecosystem approach where we have the government, the private sector, civil society um, working together to address all, all these problems. So in that way, there can be knowledge uh, sharing. Um, just in terms of practically what, what has happened, which we can look at um, as examples of multinationals playing a critical role. Uh, we all know um, uh, MassMat and, and the kind of work that they have done throughout um, different countries in terms of promoting um, women, you know, in, 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 in uh, not particularly women, but driving transformation of the local um, uh, people. And one of such examples as well is the, the pharma support centers that were done by uh, Starbucks where they are in 83 um, countries. After they ran through an intellectual uh, property complication uh, with the coffee farmers, this multinational, it used this muscle to get a win-win enterprise development initiatives. And these initiatives, um, they, where they, had, which is part of a socio-economic investment initiative. They work there with government in developing the coffee producing economies. And that has seen a number of, of farmers um, developing more in the worst uh, remote areas. So if those multinationals can really focus on the needs of the country, bring their technical knowledge to those countries, we can have a win-win. But the critical factor is collaboration and working across all the sectors. So much uh, for that and for emphasizing the importance of multinationals uh, to share uh, their, their, their capacity and their technical knowledge uh, with all um, the, in the countries that they work in, in order to enable uh, the people in those countries, particularly women, uh, to be able to engage productively uh, in the economy. I see that we have on screen now uh, Dr. Gwen uh, Ramukhupa. Uh, it's so nice to have you uh, with us. And I would like to ask you um, about the role in that you think that uh, corporations, that government, that other uh, actors in the private sector can play uh, in uh, bridging uh, the gender equality gap? Thank you very much, um, uh, Program Director, and um, greetings to everyone. Maybe let me say protocol observed. Uh, and I'm really privileged to participate in this dialogue uh, in a year that uh, uh, celebrates uh, the life of uh, a woman um, of uh, stealth, of tenacity and uh, who did not uh, uh, make her background be a stumbling block for advancing herself and advancing uh, her community and, and her nation as well. Uh, but indeed, we are also celebrating a generation of women uh, of, uh, of Africa that were at the forefront of uh, the liberation uh, including uh, some of the eminent uh, persons that are in this dialogue. Um, uh, President uh, 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 Salib, uh, pre uh, our chairperson of the uh, UN Women, the director of UN Women, Nkosuzana uh, Tlameni Zuma was the chair of uh, UN AU, uh, as well as uh, others here. But we also celebrate the fact that women uh, of, uh, uh, who are in leadership are not saying uh, we alone can carry this burden of uh, uh, making sure that generation equality is realized whilst we live. It's not something for the future. We must realize it now whilst we live. Uh, and indeed, 
uh, hand holding with the younger generations as well. Uh, and indeed, we, we, as we celebrate the contribution of these women, we un understand that political systems have evolved. Menko Susanna referred to also some of the UN uh, declarations, the regulatory framework, uh, and the regulatory frameworks in many countries, including ours in South Africa, uh, have now declared equality uh, as, a, as a right, as a human right. So we, we must go beyond just political uh, equality and, and look at uh, how we achieve inclusive uh, growth as well as a, a shared prosperity. Uh, and in this regard, uh, albeit uh, uh, Dr. Mokokong did refer to some progress that has been made, uh, it is still um, a drop uh, in the ocean. Uh, much more still needs to be done. And I think that uh, collaborative effect, uh, uh, efforts that have been made around the response uh, to COVID, uh, for instance, or even the response in the past to the Soccer World Cup in South Africa, uh, uh, between public and private sector, as well as uh, uh, between um, uh, those that are in, in government, in, in, in corporates and civil society leaders, uh, that collaboration is very critical. Uh, it is critical because all of us as leaders, regardless of the sector we, we are in, must be held accountable. Uh, I want to acknowledge the work that uh, uh, this initiative, uh, partnership with the uh, Bethel Clover Foundation and uh, University of Pretoria uh, made a significant contribution in uh, the policies that have been adopted by government on, uh, 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 on making uh, women access the procurement um, uh, 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 rent uh, in our context. Uh, and uh, we, we need more and more of investment in uh, uh, knowledge, uh, the tools that can make us uh, translate the legislative um, provisions, the policy provisions into real uh, improvement of access to opportunities by women. I think as uh, many speakers have said, women are ready. They've long been ready to participate in the mainstream economy. Um, uh, and uh, the, it is the, the systematic exclusion and systemic exclusion and structural exclusion uh, that is a, a key problem. Uh, when, we, when I was chair of uh, the Progressive Women's Movement um, in Gauteng, which is a multi-party, multi-sectoral uh, forum for, for women, um, we actually introduced uh, women cooperatives uh, to start providing linen uh, to uh, the Department of Health in, 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 in one of the provinces in Gauteng, and uh, they, they were established. So we need such progressive enabling uh, you know, uh, interventions by both government and private sector. If they are private hospitals, uh, there's no reason why they cannot um, also have, uh, uh, you know, progressive uh, procurement um, uh, 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 regulations uh, to ensure that uh, women are not left behind. But I think there is an initiative that um, the, the UN is also adopting. Uh, as part of uh, making sure that uh, most of us as countries, uh, including in uh, our continent in Africa, achieve the sustainable development goals whilst leaving no one behind. And it is the, pros, the, the, the policy of localization of government. In our country, we refer to it as a district development model, where national, uh, the good national uh, priorities and national programs must be just specially referenced so that uh, no community is left behind. And in most cases, mobility, um, those that can cope with mobility are men. Uh, and you'd find that in rural areas and areas that are left behind in terms of investments um, uh, in development, uh, it's mainly women who are left behind. So um, just specially referencing uh, the development uh, plans and programs of government also ensures that no one is left behind. And in particular, women are able to access uh, the investment opportunities. 
I always challenge, and in this program, we are led by Uma Mkosazana, uh, and, and the program is also championed uh, by the president. Uh, and, and that is a program where women must say, we also can contribute and are willing to contribute to beneficiating um, uh, the minerals uh, that we have uh, in our continent uh, and also us in South Africa. Uh, so that we see less and less of uh, this extractionist economy where raw material live without being beneficiated. So if our focus in, uh, in, in, in Africa as well as uh, in uh, South Africa can be beneficiating uh, the natural resources that we have, uh, we can certainly make sure that women have better access uh, and that youth are also not left behind. Uh, and maybe finally, um, to, to also say that uh, uh, as we recover uh, from COVID-19, uh, we, we, we should use this as an opportunity to reconstruct our economies. And policy is very critical, but uh, we need to work as a collective of society. Every leader must account. Leaders in the church, faith-based community, or you know, Muslim, whatever faith, uh, people uh, practice, leaders in society, um, NGOs, leaders in the corporate sector, and leaders in government. All of us must account uh, on uh, our contribution to ensure that uh, generation equality happens in our lifetime, and that the, the youth of today, when they are our age, uh, they find an even much equal and better a society and a true demographic dividend, leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and for emphasizing that leadership uh, exists in all parts of society. It's not just, uh, you know, government uh, leaders or, or in the corporate sector, but that leaders in all aspects and all parts of society have a role to play uh, in bridging uh, the gender gap. Also important, I think, what you mentioned about uh, the way in which government governance models uh, can contribute towards uh, really supporting women where they are. Uh, so the district development model Model, localizing uh, both uh, government responses and policy, uh, but also uh, providing the context for women to uh, participate economically where they are, uh, whether that is in rural areas uh, or in some of the urban centers. So thank you so much uh, for that uh, contribution, uh, Doctor. Um, Prof Coupe, I want to turn to you. And we've heard so much about uh, the role of different parts of society uh, in uh, in achieving uh, the goals and the aims of generation equality. Uh, what do you think the role is? You spoke about it uh, to some degree earlier today in your uh, opening address, but the role of public and private sector uh, knowledge institutions, uh, what role do they have to play to prioritize the integration of women uh, in the economy, uh, but also in uh, decision making. And what do you think are the implications and the possibilities uh, of such uh, integration on the development of the African continent? I think by, by nature and by role in society, public higher education institutions, and I also want to underline public higher education institutions, have a responsibility to engender impact and not just any impact, but transformative impact in society. We have the privilege of actually having sitting back and reflecting on things that other people have to deal with on a daily basis. And sometimes, because they deal with them on a daily basis in complex situations, the, the operational overtakes a reflective side, if you like to see whether something is, is, is happening. So universities have that privilege through the, through the fact that through the public funding that we get, we are enabled to do research, if you like, to look at all of the factors, to analyze them, and then to suggest what the evidence says should be the best policies. So we're in a better position to address some of those things that uh, Ms. Fry pointed out, is that good intentions in a policy, but uh, people working in an emergency situation do not realize the unintended consequences. We as university, actors and researchers can say, well, wait a minute, you forgot X, Y, Z. Mm. 
and to be inclusive and for this policy to be impactful, this is what you ought to do. And so that we must do again with the, some sense of urgency as well. Reflection for me doesn't mean universities should take forever to do that. They should also, in a sense, be able to be up on their feet, on the go, when situations happen, because we're doing this on a daily basis and we have the tools to analyze something, something that has gone wrong. And also with them, you know, computing and so many things, you know, data analytics and all of that, we are able to produce results much faster. I mean, let me just refer to what happened during COVID. Vaccines were produced faster than they normally are. Normally vaccines took years to produce, years to test, and years to administer to people. The Pfizer vaccine, for example, has now got a full FDA approval in the sense that it's no longer a trial and, and, and it's an efficacious vaccine. But point I'm making also is that universities have another role that they play, public universities, is to produce high quality graduates who are trained enough mm -hmm. to go into the working world, whether it's in government, civil society, in the private sector, bring new perspectives to them. So I was very pleased to hear uh, Dr. Anna Mohokong saying that where she has worked, she enables the recruitment of women into particular kinds of positions. So imagine that what she needs when she sits in that board is a pipeline coming from the university of young, well-educated, highly trained women with multiple perspectives, knowing that the work situation has not been able to engender gender justice, gender equity and equality, and coming into those things. So I see us having a very immense responsibility uh, uh, providing high quality education that is relevant, contextual, and addresses the gaps that we have in society, and gender equality is one of them. And on the other, uh, and, and complementary to that, producing the kind of research that is not gender blind, recognizes that even past research did not prioritize gender. So that is why it's important to have a transdisciplinary approach to break the silos between the disciplines in the academy and their understanding of societal issues. The third thing I would like to say is that universities or higher education must also be intentional. Mm -hmm. We must work this way when we do our research and train people. We mustn't simply say, what are we interested in researching and teaching? That's very nice. And we can do that very well. We must also ask the question, what societal problems are there? And what solutions can we bring to those societal issues? And we mustn't then just do that in the context of these nice rooms. We must also then engage the stakeholders in society and say, how do you understand it as a problem? Because how I understand it as a professor theoretically, and typically on our continent as well, we tend to be slavish to the textbooks and theoretical notions from North America and Europe. The best way to understand the, the, our own issues is to be context specific, but also to be understanding that these things are global issues and how others have dealt with them. But the solutions will be very much contextual. So, 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 so we mustn't, if you like, bring, walk around with solutions uh, looking for a problem. We must rather ask what are the problems and then to generate the solutions. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Don't walk around with solutions looking for a problem. Find out what the problem is and then design the appropriate solutions. Uh, Ms. Fry, I want to just ask you, and given the kind of work that you do, um, working with, uh, with ordinary women, so, much, so many of these conversations tend to be quite top down. So they're like clever people in a room who uh, think up uh, solutions uh, and then present them uh, to people um, who, that their solutions are meant to help. What more do you think can be done to make sure that we engage with women at all levels of society, including rural women, um, including impoverished women, to make sure that the um, policies that we come up with actually can impact the people they're meant to? I think having real conversations is tricky, and we have to acknowledge that. Um, as Prof. Cooper was saying, possibly the impact of COVID enabled us to see and speak and engage differently. And I think we need to be more open to how that happens. We know, for instance, that mobile technology is something which has broken through many boundaries. Um, we know that the, the digital divide is something that could increase inequalities um, if, for instance, the costs of data are not addressed. And the Competition Commission in December 2019 had a very interesting ruling that actually compelled 
data service providers to provide significantly more amounts of data. So, I mean, in response to your question, I would say that we need to look at how using technology we can leapfrog to an inclusive and caring state. One of the things that I mentioned um, in my address on the Mandela Day initiative was looking at the role of mobile technology, so phones, smartphones, as a way that the Department of Social Development could actually reach everybody. We know that uh, WhatsApp has introduced an e-wallet. So are there ways in which we can use mobile technology to ensure that everybody's included, that COVID messaging, for instance, goes to everybody's phone, that we reduce the costs um, so that people can have conversations which doesn't deplete their, their limited resources, um, and that we enable our, our own tech, tech um, companies to start developing and producing mobile devices. And it, it's something that we're looking at uh, at SPY to see how we can use technology, not just to bring people to a certain point, but to, to get, make it go further. We know that the education received by kids in state schools um, in, in the last year was between 80 and 100% less than what, had happened, what they'd received in the previous time. So, and, and that's actually our failing. We have the SABC, we have the so many abilities to use technology, and yet those who are excluded are left behind on an increasing basis every day. I think what we need to be looking at, and that just goes back to my, my earlier point about how we can use the spaces we have. We need change and not charity. We need to take all the wisdom that's being given to us today and say, what are the concrete things that we can do to take forward? Um, and I just want to, I, I want to just use the space. One of the I did a review of the basic income grant pilot in Namibia. Um, and the, the pilot was in a very small village in the middle of the desert. Uh, I went to a woman and she was growing exotic flowers. And we, we heard about exotic plants earlier. And I said to her, um, I came with all my knowledge, my top down knowledge, and I expected that she would be growing food. So I said to her, why have you, are you growing these flowers? And she said, for the first time ever, because of this uh, basic income grant that I'm receiving, I can have beauty. Uh, and it, it, I, was, I had shivers done because we have this expectation that people are meant to behave in certain ways because that's what the science tells us. But at the heart of it, we have ourselves, our humanity and our Ubuntu. And I really hope that the, the hub and the generation of the knowledge that comes there doesn't lose the fact that we need to be coming together in solidarity with the humanity that we can share. So, Oh, I love that. Uh, that you know, when you've got, when your basic needs are taken care of, um, then uh, you have the space uh, for beauty, uh, which is a fundamental human need as much as anything else. Uh, and then final question I want to give to you, uh, Prof. Margaret, about the work that you do, um, not just as a researcher, but also as a teacher um, with uh, students in uh, the university and in your faculty. What, are the, what do you think are the, are the skills um, and the capabilities that you try to impart on both women, but also on the male students as well, uh, to be able to create uh, a, a, an equal society in our lifetimes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mbete. So what I want to repeat is that everything we do starts with education. I, it was mentioned in the UN report 2018 that if we did not educate women, we will not attain the 2030 goals. Speakers already mentioned this as well. So, so education right from the beginning is critical. By the time that uh, uh, young men and women come to us at the university, they've already received a great deal of knowledge. And, and I want to emphasize the importance of that in relation as well to the losses that have occurred during the pandemic. But in the university, we recognize, and as I mentioned, in our faculty, we have researchers passionate about growing women leaders. Again, without women leadership, we had throughout that we would not be able to attain all these uh, uh, discussions that we are talking about. Educating women and giving them higher education degrees is critical. It's critical because then we retain some of them as future uh, leaders and mentors to others which is also critical because we send them out into the industry to become leaders and influence in the places of work 
in government, in politics, and enhance uh, gender and women uh, issues. So that is very critical. So we not only specifically target certain numbers of women in terms of uh, attaining degrees, but we also educate them as full around uh, individuals. We don't send them out into the workplace with just the knowledge of the discipline. We send them out as uh, uh, individuals, men and women, that have critical skills, other skills that are required in the workplace. So, for example, issues of equality. We, we talk about this, we, we, uh, uh, we persuade, we teach, we, we model uh, um, ourselves around all these critical skills that we know our, our students, in, once they graduate out of our universities, would need over and above the knowledge of discipline. So the future world of work is central to the work that we do in the university and indeed in, in our Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. Thank you so much uh, to our panelists and to all the speakers that we've had today uh, for such a rich, engaging discussion uh, and one that has pointed to the urgency uh, of this agenda of women's emancipation, but also uh, to the reality that this is not just something that we want to do uh, because it's a nice thing to do or a good thing to do. It is good governance and it makes for good business uh, for everybody uh, all of humanity to be equally included uh, in the way in which our societies operate and in the economies of our respective societies. Uh, I would now like to ask uh, Professor Coupe to uh, provide uh, the closing uh, and the thanks uh, for this event. Oh, thank you, Dr. Mbete. Oh, you want me to go to the podium? Okay. I was getting comfortable on the seat there. Yeah. So, so I think um, in speaking previously, I might have made some closing comments, which were premature. When I was speaking, I said, no, now I'm speaking as if we have finished. But I was anticipating what happened, which I'm glad I said that is that this indeed had been a, a very rich discussion. And also you saw the caliber of the, 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 the women who have massive experience that the tradition of Charlotte Matlake is not lost. It actually lives on. It's what I call a living legacy. The reason it is a living legacy is because the problems that Charlotte Matlake was addressing have yet to be resolved. And so we, we owe her a debt of gratitude in what she did, but we also owe her an apology for what we have not yet done. And that is why I say that there is now a sense of agency. If Charlotte Matlake were to they arise today and ask us, what have you been doing? It, it would be shameful to a certain extent. That, I, I'm saying that with not uh, negating some of the gains we have made. There are gains that have been made, but they are simply not enough for where we are. This is 2021. If you take our democracy in 1994, certain things are in the constitution. They have not been realized. And also, we can't, we can't say it is for lack of ideas. It is not. That constitution was respecting the things that Charlotte McClurk and others did. Now, the time is now for us to actually speed up. So, as I heard today, there's a number of things that we ought to do. We actually have to work across the board and work together with a sense of urgency. It's not just the university. It's not just the private sector. It's not just uh, something we didn't emphasize but was implicit. It's not just women have to do it for themselves. Yes, men cannot give it to women. They failed so far. Many people spoke about the entrenched patriarchy and how I think in certain areas it is worse. So, so, so we have to conscientize the entire society to understand that this is a task for everybody. And it's a task for everybody because if you achieve gender equity and equality, you actually advance society as a whole. You restore all of our humanity. Because without gender equality, and particularly in South Africa and across the continent, with various forms of gender-based violence and femicide, we have all lost our humanity. And, and regaining our humanity is not just about economic empowerment. It's actually restoring the sense of being a, a, a human being, the sense of justice, and nobody ought to be violated in, 20, in 2021. So, so, so it's a multifaceted task. And part of gender-based violence and, and femicide also results in 
the various areas in which women are not equal to men and do not have their own agency and their own power. So it's, it's, it's very, very important to understand that there is an economic side to gender-based violence and femicide. And also that any crisis that occurs in society, a pandemic like this, often interestingly exacerbates but also illuminates the inequalities that exist in our society and that we have the knowledge and the power to do so. So I think that as we leave this dialogue today, a dialogue should lead to a series of actions and sustained actions. Because this is an intractable issue. This is one of what the things we call in the humanities as, you know, wicked problems of society. With the wicked problems of society, you need a sustained agenda until you achieve the, the, the goals. But also, as I said, sense of urgency, the time is now. We all, Shayat Matleke and the women of 1956 and 1913, as you said, and various other gender markers that have been included, you know, we owe them the responsibility to resolve this situation. And as I would say, in, in our African cultures, so that they can rest peacefully. Thank you. <laughs>